Amen. We, we do live in a troubled world, don't we? Um, we're trying to make sense of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, not forgetting that Russia and Ukraine are at war. We live in a troubled, troubled world that reminds us that humans um, throughout the millennia, throughout history, have a hard time getting along. Always seems to be a war, a conflict, a battle going on. And of course, we see this in our own personal lives. We have a hard time in relationships. Uh, we have a difficult time just getting along. And yet, coupled with that, we've been created for relationship. To be created in the image of God, we've noted recently, is to be created relational. He is forever loving and relational. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, a triune God. For eternity, past and present future. So created in His image, we were created for relationship. We have a homing device within us, it says in Romans 1, that draws us to God into this Trinitarian relationship. And yet, we fight against that as well. We, we push against the relationship that God is calling us into. We see too in recent days as we've talked much about the importance of relationships with one another. How uh, the lack of relationship and the lack of healthy, strong, vibrant, loving relationships in our lives impact our lives across the board. Science bears this out. Science catches up with what scripture teaches us. And though we all can walk through loneliness at times, it's common for all of us. Um, in varying seasons of our lives. Maybe you're feeling lonely in this season, in these days. Loneliness is common, and yet it can become, for some, a pervasive and chronic condition that if not addressed, and here's the challenge, when we don't feel like reaching out to others, we don't feel like uh, we want to get out of isolation, and yet it takes us further and further in. Uh, it can create all kinds of trouble, right? Not just... Just anxiety and depression, we've talked about much. Social isolation uh, brings about higher rates of suicidal ideation and, and, and uh, substance abuse. Physical problems, doctors will tell you, as we look at holistic health, are related to the lack of healthy relationships in our lives. And every time we see a mass shooting or something that takes place, someone who's mentally unstable, they are often isolated living alone without healthy relationships. All this to say, not only do we need relationships in our lives, we need healthy, loving, good, strong relationships. This is what we're going to talk about in the weeks that lead us up to Advent. And this week, again, has been a stark reminder for me of the value and the importance of close friendships. I will miss my friend Brian Dunnigan. Uh, as I know, he was texting me. We were texting the night before he passed away. He was uh, curious about how things went last Sunday as we were talking together. We uh, would meet often together, a uh, small group of pastors. You can imagine um, a bond between pastors is unlike anything. I mean, it's other areas of life, I suppose, different affinities. But to be in the same parish, to be in the same community serving, there's a special bond between several of us in this community. We love each other greatly, and all we could do on Thursday morning was come together and weep and ask why and really have no words. But I'm grateful for loving friends in my life, and many of you who even this week reached out um, to offer encouragement, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, because it's possible, you see, as we move into this series of messages now, where we focus on the one another, some of them, I think there's some 49 of them, but we're going to look at some in the latter part of Ephesians. It's why we're reading Ephesians in our um, dwell reading plan together. And, and while we're jumping to Isaiah as well, that's helping set us up for the Advent season as we wanted to read through the entire book of uh, Isaiah as well. But as we move into this series uh, of messages and this season, it's possible to have heard what we heard last week, uh, to talk about a vision forward and here's where we're going and here's what we're going to do or seek to accomplish. And in a results-based uh, kind of a ends justifies the means culture, it's possible for us to think that, and this is true in all phases of life, what we do is more important than, watch this, who we are becoming. If we accomplish this thing, then we're successful. 
And we all know that we can accomplish many great things, I suppose, in life and leave God out of it completely. In fact, many people accomplish much by bowling over, just mowing down others to get to where they want to be. We see this in leadership in America. We see it in politics. We see it across the board. But we're marked by something different. We've already been singing about it, celebrating it. We are marked by love. And that's the one thing that marks us. Regardless of what we're trying to do, who we are becoming is what's most important. To become more than we imagine us to be. More like Jesus as we pursue Him. And so I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the first seven verses. We read them together. And we're going to see that one of the primary ways that we show love for one another is by promoting, uh, maintaining, pursuing unity in the body. Now, we'll apply this into our lives as well. I want you to be thinking about relationships that you're in as well. But we're talking about, he, this, is a, this is an in-house document, okay? This is a word for the church. This is not for all who are outside the church. This is for us. We come to this point in Ephesians, always important to place it in context. What's happened throughout the first few chapters is that Paul has been talking about um, the gospel indicatives, we call them. Indicatives are just statements of fact. Here's the truth about who you were. Here's what Christ has done for you. He has come to rescue you from your sin. You were alienated from God. You were sons and daughters of disobedience. You were hell bound and Christ entered in. He comes and he lives the perfect life we could not live. He dies on the cross for you. Now we see what he calls the manifold uh, wisdom of God in the gospel. And so this is so important to understand because we do this in our personal lives. We jump to what do I need to do? What do I do? How do I, how do, I, how do, I do these good things? What, what deeds must I accomplish as if to attain some approval from God. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Let's talk about who we are in him, a new identity we have. Now then, from that, we can talk about how we live. So we move from the gospel indicatives to the gospel imperatives, to the commands, to the things that we will do. A lot of action points in this passage uh, of chapter 4, and we're going to see some of them here today. We're united in Christ. He unites us. But now, I want you to see three things. If you take notes on sermons, I want you to see we're unified in our deeds. Okay? We're unified in our doctrine. I'm going to ask you to put on your theological caps today. We're going to dive deep. And we are united, unified in, this one's a twist, in our diversity. I'm going to argue that we don't really have unity apart from diversity. We may have uniformity. That's something else. But unity comes out of diversity. Okay, so let's get back to verse 1 out of chapter 4. I therefore, this is what he does often, what I have said all the way to this point. You are new in Christ. He's, he's articulated that out of this new identity. Therefore, let's talk about it. As a prisoner of the Lord. And he's literally a prisoner at this time. But he's also talking about he's, he's a prisoner to Christ. I'm bound to him. He's Lord. He's leader. He's master of my life. He says, I urge you to walk, here it is, to live, to act in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So let's live up to this high calling that God's placed on us. Let's respond to his grace in a way that's appropriate. And then he lists it out. Look at this. With all humility, this is how we're to walk. These are the deeds. In gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, in love, eager is the word quick to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace so first i want you to see we are unified in deeds now again think about this once we come to faith in christ we are becoming like someone right we're becoming like one singular person capital p we're becoming like jesus so think about it if all of us together and believers around the world are seeking to become like Jesus, responding to his grace by faith, we're going to start to look like each other. Now, we are varied and again, diverse and different personalities and walks of life. But if we're all seeking to act like Jesus, we're going to be unified in our deeds. It's why you can come across another person and you can discern perhaps that they're a believer before you even know it. And then you find out, ah, I knew you were. By the way that you live and by the spirit within us. 
So we're unified around these actions. And again, to be clear, unity is not uniformity. We'll talk about that in, in a bit. So how are we unified in deeds? Now, here's what I want you to think about applying this, this message, always applying, not simply hearing me for, for a bit here, but to apply. Now he's going to list these things. Let's, let's unpack them for a moment. In humility, he says, first of all, which is the mark of a believer. So all of these build on one another, which is interesting. Watch this. In humility, C.S. Lewis famously said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Now this is not just a little anecdotal or a little quip that sounds interesting. This is actually applied can change your life. Because see, we can grow in humility. You can actually spiritual discipline. You can actually grow in humility. And it's not, well, I have a horrible self-esteem. I'm looking down on myself. I need to stop being so prideful. So I'm going to just beat myself down. That's not what humility is. Humility instead is, is a power. It's a, a gentleness in control of power is what it is. You might know that when we talk about meekness. Um, we sang about earlier. Meekness is, is gentleness. It's like Jesus. So here's how you can discern this in our own lives. I thought about this. There are two types of people. One person steps into the room and says, here I am. Right? Focused on self and not others. Another person walks into the room and they say, ah, oh, there you are. There you are. Thinking of my, how's that happen? Think of myself less. Think about others more. That's how you think about yourself less. Which is why serving others, loving others, getting outside of ourselves is how we become more and more humble. Now, you can also do this. A lot of us think of an extrovert that comes in a room and says, here I am. Applaud me. Receive me, please. Help me feel good about myself. But we can also walk into a room and say, well, I hope I, I, hope I look just right. I'm not sure if I did I dress just right. Am I good? I hope I make a good, good impression. I hope that uh, you receive. See, it's all about me again. And we all have a tendency to do this. Here's another way that you can measure this. When you hear news that comes your way, are you first asking the question, how does this impact me? Instead of, how does this impact people around me? How does this news impact others? And how might I care for others? See, this is humility. It's a, it's a strength that's under control. And, and here's this word gentleness. This is, this is where we see this, this word. This is meekness. Okay, now I'm moving on to humility and they're tied together. You can't have, watch this, you can't have gentleness without humility. Because if you don't, if you're thinking of yourself, your gentleness will become a tool of manipulation. Here's what I mean. And we've all discerned this, perhaps. Maybe we've done it. You've seen it with people who are so nice. They are so kind to you. They're just talking about how amazing you are. And you have a sense. This is a law of reciprocity. You want back from me is what's going on here. You see, there's a difference between that kind of gentleness that, again, is manipulated for one's purpose. It's the old um, phrase, you get more flies from honey than with vinegar, is what's going on there. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is attributed with saying that. That is, uh, the sweeter I am, the more you're going to like me. That, again, that's about me. It's not about you. Genuine gentleness is empowering others around you and lifting them up, not for your sake, but for their sake. Then he says, in patience. In patience. Now this is a word that really is helpful in every relationship. How are you doing here? And be aware, start praying for patience. That is a dangerous prayer to pray. Pray for patience and you'll see over and over again opportunities that you have to be patient. Um, patience in the body looks like uh, pace. It looks like coming along alongside uh, someone. We do this when people are grieving. We do it when we're seeking to teach or to guide people. You don't walk at the same pace um, if you're holding the hand of a two-year-old, right? You walk at their pace or you're dragging them along. That's not good parenting. Um, instead, you're walking at their pace. Now, this is true in any organization. It's true in the church. It doesn't mean that we're going to just hang out with the laggards who are never coming along. But it does mean we're going to be patient as we walk together. Parents don't anticipate that middle schoolers or even high schoolers have the, the mental, 
uh, acumen or the discernment that a mature Christ follower would have. But we're patient with them because we know this. So we're drawing them along. So we walk in patience with one another, which demands grace. I would say this next one, he, he uses the word bearing with. I'm going to say in forgiveness. We walk in humility, in gentleness, in patience. See how they build? And in forgiveness. This word is really interesting. Bearing with one another means that you put up with someone in provocation. Um, with, with provocation. In other words, when you're provoked by someone. And it's interesting that he uses this word specifically because this is where it's hardest. This is where the love that we need to extend to the others in our lives is most necessary, it's most needed, and it's the hardest. When you're provoked, when someone else provokes you. And here's the thing, let's be honest, those who are closest to us, often in marriage, in our families, those who know us best can provoke us the most, right? And so we extend grace and forgiveness. I say it all the time with young families getting married, I mean young, young, uh, young people, young couples getting married, um, the, the, that marriage is the union of two good forgivers. Because we're constantly having to forgive one another. But to bear with, to endure with someone is what it is. To persevere with someone who is provoking you, who's difficult. How do we respond? With love. With grace. That's radical stuff. But that's what marks us as believers. Because in every relationship, you see, we all have people in our lives who are what has been described as the e EGRs in our lives. Have you heard this? The people who just extra grace required is what it is. We all have people in our lives who just some extra grace is required. And when you see them or know them, they might be a spouse. They may be in your family. Extra grace required. They ought to have a label. E-G-R. There's extra grace coming your way. And that's how I'm going to live. Now, here's the truth. Every single one of us. In some relationship that we have relationships or in any relationships at some point, we are the ones who are the EGRs. Again, humility would help me discern that to be gentle, patient, and forgive, but I need that kind of grace in my life, right? And so all of this leads to then putting up with one another, forgiving one another. It leads to how we walk together in unity. That's where this lands. Notice that he says, eager to maintain unity. This word eager is important to understand. This is why I want to highlight this. It means to be diligent. It means to be zealous. Friend, I want to ask you, are you quick to guard? This is, it is an ongoing, on guard, fast, quick, to maintain, to watch for, to be aware, is what it means. Of what? That which will unite us. Let's constantly fight for unity to maintain the bond, the glue that holds us together. This peace that God wants us to live in. You see, a divided nation needs a united church right now. And our city needs to see a united church of those of us who are diverse generationally is as much of anything as brings about diversity. That we love one another even though we're different, different backgrounds, different takes on things. We'll talk further about that. We're united in deeds. But watch this. We're also united in our doctrine. This is, this is very important for us today. I want us again to put our theological caps on here for a moment. Because everything we do flows out of what we believe. Theology matters. And I want to talk about this for a moment. Look at verse 4. He lays out kind of a list of sorts. There's one body. There's one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now we say it this way. Christ centers us. That's one of our distinctives we've talked about. And this means even in our theology. Watch this. Our Christology, what we believe about Jesus, drives our theology. Theology is what we believe about God. Our Christology drives our theology. I'd say it this way. We don't look at Mohammed to figure out who God is. We don't look at Confucius to figure out who God is. We don't look at Moses to figure out who God is. We don't look at Buddha to figure out who God is. We look at Jesus. Because as we've noted recently, he is perfect theology embodied. What is God like? He came here to show us. 
exactly who he is and how he would live if he were in bodily form. Now, watch this, and let's, let's go through this list. We have one body. We are, interesting, we are the body of Christ. Think about this. We are the visible expression as a local church in particular. See, you could say any person who belongs to the universal church, who's come to faith in Christ, uh, they are part of the universal church. Our friends at Highland Park Presbyterian Church who've come to faith in Jesus, they are part of the global church. But you don't see the universal church. Not really. We don't see the church gathered globally, but we see our church gathered in worship. We'll see our church gather in our connect groups in, uh, in the fall fest this afternoon. And others who come in see how we love each other. The visible church on the move and yes, in the city. We have one body. This is the, the ecclesia. Those of us who are called out to be this church in this time. Philippians 3.20, Paul says, we are citizens of heaven who now have come together as his body, ambassadors, and we are representatives of a kingdom infiltration in the world. One body, look at this, one spirit. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit. Every person who receives Christ receives the Holy Spirit living in each one of us. We have one spirit. Look at this, one hope. There's a singular hope that we have, and our hope is in Christ. In him, the best is yet to come. Even death itself doesn't separate us from him. We have one hope, and it's found in Christ alone. Why? Because we have one Lord. He is Lord of all. He is the master leader of everything. And he's the one we proclaim as Lord. You think about this. You ask an early uh, a Christian from the early, early church, what is this movement all about? They would say, well, it's all about Jesus. In fact, to proclaim him Lord, even at baptism or at any point, was a political statement. Because even today, when you say he's Lord of your life, you're saying he's master, leader, ruler over your life. Which means nothing else is. No one else is. And for them to proclaim him, not Caesar, but Christ is Lord, uh, could get you put to death. It's why many uh, experienced martyrdom in those first centuries of the church and why we still see it today around the globe. He's Lord of my life and no one else is Lord. You ask someone from the early church, what is this all about? They would talk about Jesus himself. This is important because what happens is you talk to a new believer. This, I've seen this through the years. I talked to a person who just recently came to Christ just last week. I talked to someone who just came. You know what they talk about? They talk about Jesus. They talk about what he's done for them. But then what can happen if we're not careful? Talk to a person who's been a believer a long time. What do they talk about? They talk about church. They talk about church involvement, the ministry they've been involved in. They talk about the things they've done. They talk about uh, some, maybe some non-core issue. Let's talk about what do you believe about this? Let's talk about the denominational thing. And Jesus is somewhere in the mix. But let's, let, friends, listen. Let's not let him be number six or seven down the list. He needs to be the first thing we talk about. The one that we talk about. What's this movement about? If you're a guest, what is this church all about? We're about Jesus himself. That's who we worship. He's Lord of everything that we do. And then look at this. One faith, he says. This is, yes, personal faith in Christ. But this, is the, this refers to the objective Christian confession as a set of beliefs and doctrine. This is why you could call it the Christian faith. That's what we're talking about here. Which, yes, most of it has to do with the person and the work of Jesus. One baptism. We see this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is invisible, which is then seen in the baptism that we've seen even visibly today. When Shannon, Gracie, or, or, or Ann Moore, when Annie, each one of them step in the baptistry and say, Jesus is Lord, they are also showing this visible sign of forgiveness, but also the Spirit of God that has filled them up, and now they're committed to Him. There's an engrafting of the Spirit, one Spirit, into the Trinitarian relationship that we have. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He invites us in, and then we show that to the world, which points us to this one God. One God, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. People say, you know, everybody really, all religions worship the same God. No, they do not. 
We might be seeking after the same God, perhaps. There is an ultimate God. But no, no, no. Not everyone worships the God of the Bible. And so I want to show you this that I think is really helpful. Again, let's, let's wrap our minds around the doctrine that guides us. I want you to see concentric circles, okay? And this will be helpful. You can even draw this on your, where it has notes. But in the center is the core. As you move out, you have then convictions, which are not core essentials to Christianity. They might be very important, might be biblical things that you have many convictions about. And then you have uh, opinions, and then we all have questions. The point of showing you this is we've got to stay focused on what is core, not even what our convictions are. We may differ on biblical even convictions that are not core. We all have opinions and preferences. What we saw last week, just as an example, if you weren't here, we gathered our entire church family together in in one big service. We packed the place. And we had to do what Paul said in Philippians 2. Now we knew this going in. All of us. We're going to go in. It's not about me. My preferences. What I want church to be. My opinions about what we ought to sing. My take and my strong convictions about how this ought to go down. I'm going to instead, what Paul says in in Philippians 2, 8. I'm going to consider others as more important than myself. That's what a healthy family does. That's what your healthy family does. Let's consider the whole so that we can come together, be united. And I praise God for our church family and says, let's do this. Across generational lines, backgrounds, or different venues, even languages, color of skin, all of this. None of this matters outside of the core. So here's what's important. We've got to be white hot focused about what is core. All right? Theological hats on. What are the core doctrines? At what point do you step out of the core and say, yikes, this is not Christianity anymore? At what point are you off? Watch this. What would be on your list? When you think about orthodox, evangelical Christianity. I'd say, you know, biblical Christianity. First, Trinitarian God. Okay? Triune God. That's unique to Christianity. Saved by grace. This is central. Justified by faith, not works. How about this? Sinful humanity. And I would, I would qualify it this way. Created good, yet fallen. And I say created good because that's where we're all heading and we're becoming more and more like him all the time. The next one is hypostatic union. Now, this is a theological phrase. You can impress your friends at lunch and talk about it. Hypostatic union means union uh, of two natures. Okay? It's a fancy way of saying, here it is, fully God, fully man. Again, Christian distinctive. Unique to Christianity alone. He is our mediator. Christ is our mediator. The next is atonement. This is his finished work on the cross. Now, different Christians might get there in different ways, but we ultimately land with an atoning sacrifice, okay? Christ made reparation for us on the cross, central to our salvation. Next is resurrection. Everything rises or falls on the resurrection. Paul says if he's not risen, then we are most to be pitied. But a physical resurrection is biblical Christianity. And then finally, in some form, you'd say the renewal of all things. The restoration, the redemption, the redeeming of everything. All that has gone wrong. Everything that is wrong in this world is going to be made right. And this is the trajectory of our lives. These are core doctrines that we have here. Now I could go a while about how you determine weighing cumulative forces that, that of several considerations as to know when did you get outside of core? When did you not? Things like biblical clarity. Things about uh, relevance to the character of God. Does it match up with the way of Jesus? We, we could talk about biblical frequency and how, how much weight is brought to it. And here's a key one. Where we get outside, I'll say it this way, outside of core, we get to convictions, which could be um, what we think about LGBTQ issues, for instance. Christians differ on that. Uh, what about the role of women in ministry? Different ways to talk about the inerrancy of, of Scripture. Uh, eschatology. Where is all this heading? There are differences there. Those are not salvific issues. Those, do, those aren't a matter of salvation. Those are ways that different people interpret the Bible and such. We have our ways. And we need to have robust conversations about these things. 
But my point is this, with the LGBT issue in particular, one of the things that we do to determine is the consensus among Christians, present and past. Interesting how the global church came around this when the Methodist church started to, uh, I would argue, go a bit more progressive, a bit more liberal. <laughs> Our brothers and sisters in Africa, for instance, raised up and said, don't bring your Western Christianity to us. And in the same way, in many issues, we look at what have Christians believed about this for millennia. Because what's happening in our day, oh, it's a new day, now we understand more, and this progressive idea that now we have greater truth, um, regardless of what the, the Orthodox Church has said about issues for millennia. We, we hold fast to this. These are just ways that we distinguish what is core, what are just convictions, and then the effect that they have on our personal life and our church life. So all of these are so important. Think about this. In essence, we're talking about the, the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed, 324 AD. It goes way back, all of these doctrines, all the New Testament, which was being taught, the Didache, to the early church, they brought, they came together and said, let's, okay, let's be clear, up against heresy that was coming at the church. A new, relatively new movement and church that was forming and had come together. Now let's be clear. There are billions of Christians throughout history and today who would agree with the Apostles' Creed, for instance. That we all say these are the cores here. This is core. But notice it's pretty tight. We often make non-core issues core. When you make core issues non-core, we've said it in theological terms, that's heresy is what that is. But the, here's more likely the challenge we have. Don't make your personal convictions or your opinions core. That brings about disunity. When you say, well, you worship that way, you can't. No, I can't have fellowship with you. You, you do that differently than I do. You dress differently. You have different skin or whatever the thing might be. Or you have a different opinion on that theological issue that's not core. Don't let that divide us. This is what we're called to. And our church does this as well as any church I know. And praise be to God. We need to continue to grow. To maintain the unity that he's called us to. So, I'll close with this. We are unified in our deeds. We're unified in doctrine. And finally, we're unified in diversity. Okay, now look at this. Verse 7. But, that, term, that word is, is, is important. Uh, this is in contrast, okay, to what he's been saying. We have all of this in common, but grace was given to each one of us. So we're all different, though we have all these things in common for, for, for each of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, this is not to say, well, he's gifted that person more than me. He's got, that person has more grace than I have. They understand the gospel. He's talking about the gifts that are given to us. Yes, grace to all, and it's all equal, but it's also the varied grace and gifts that he gives us. In fact, look at 1 Peter chapter 4. We have it here, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. And every one of us have gifts. As faithful stewards, I love this, you are, a, you are a steward of the gifts that God's given you, which include, we talked about this recently, your spiritual gifts. It includes your, your heart, what you're passionate about, your abilities. It, it, it's about your personality. It's about your experience, things you've walked through, good and bad. It's about how you are then to serve him by the way you've been shaped, by him. You're a steward of that, friends. And every passing day, you are to steward the gifts and the life that he's given you of God's grace in its various forms. That we are all part of one body. But let me ask you this. What is your part? Because again, unity is not all of us being the same, acting praise be to God. And the more diverse we become as a church, the more we show the unity of the church. And again, a divided nation needs a united church. And it's in our diversity that we learn and grow. We become more like Jesus. And this is who we are becoming as we imagine the church moving forward. And Jesus showed us the way. He gathered a group of very 
different people around him. And as the church grew, it became more and more this picture of black and white, brown and yellow and everything in between. All people gathering together to worship him. This is heaven. This is where we're heading. And may it be in our day. And I'll close with this. The core is very tight. How will you apply this in your own life? In your relationships? How will we apply it in the church? In your connect group? Where will you serve? How will you step into service for others? Because the way out of your your self-centeredness is to think about yourself less by thinking about others more and putting that into action by serving others. But I'll offer this twist. Unity can be overrated. We can be united around the wrong things. And there are churches that have done that. You were united around the, around the wrong things or why churches die. They focus in on non-core issues, make them core, and the Lord lifts his hand off of those people. Because they've determined what's core, not the word of God. We will hold fast to the word of God as we seek to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. This is our role. This is what we're all about as a church family. And so I I leave you with that, to bless you, to say thank you for being such an amazing body of believers. And now I want us to pray together as we close. And then we're going to sing our way out after I offer a couple of words here. Lord, thank you for this word that you've given us today. I praise you for the unity that we have in our church, even in diversity. And so Lord, help us to stay focused on what matters the most. Help us, Lord, to be uh, focused on the core and those things that we have made non-core. Help us to die to ourselves, to defer to others, to consider others in our circles of relationship. I pray for every family here, every marriage, every friend group, every connect group, that we would continue to be diligent to maintain the unity of our wonderful church by focusing on you and you alone. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for how you have unified our church for 84 years. We praise you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen.